The grace of the Lord Jesus Christ be with you. Well, we're slow getting started today, and, uh, you know, I, I can say to you that the time, time change has affected my world uh, today. I don't know about how everybody else is feeling, and of course, uh, and I didn't think it was going to this year. I, I, I prepared myself for the change, uh, you know, all week this last week. I went to bed early and got up early, and, and yet this morning uh, was a struggle, so... Uh, of course, you know, now listen, if, it's probably not going to happen, but if somebody comes in an hour from now, don't, don't pick on them, uh, be gracious and nice, uh, it could happen to you too, uh, <laughs> and, uh, but let's do worship the Lord and just plan on being ready to open our hearts to whatever God wants to do amongst us in this place today. Daryl, come lead us. Good morning. We have a few announcements this morning, as you'll see in the bulletin. Um, the building committee met this past Thursday, and we decided to hold an informational meeting about our progress so far on the building committee for the new sanctuary. And that informational meeting will be next Sunday, immediately following worship service. So make plans to stay after worship service next Sunday to uh, answer some questions, uh, to update, ask some questions, answer some questions, find, find out about what's been going on with the building committee. Uh, this Wednesday evening, Blanton's Chapel will share a meal together. and. Uh, Pastor Bob will lead a Bible study, and we are invited. So this Wednesday at 6 o'clock, just uh, bring some food to share and let Brother Bob know if you might be coming. Church Council will meet on Thursday, March 23rd, to work on information required by the conference to continue uh, for disaffiliation. And the next meeting of the building committee will be on Friday, uh, will be on April 13th at 5 o'clock. Do we have any other announcements to share this morning? Susan, do you, about the... Anybody else have any announcements to make? All right. Well, our first hymn is Nothing But the Blood, which is number 362. So if you want to stand and join me in singing.
nothing but the blood of Jesus. This is all my righteousness, nothing but the blood of Jesus. Oh, precious is the blood that makes me right as snow. No other grounds I know, nothing but the blood of Jesus. And now if you would please join me in reciting the Apostles' Creed, which is found on number 881. I believe in God, the Father Almighty, maker of heaven and earth, and in Jesus Christ, his only Son, our Lord, who was conceived by the Holy Spirit, born of the Virgin Mary, suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, dead, and buried. The third day he rose from the dead, descended into heaven, and sitteth at the right hand of God, the Father Almighty. From thence he shall come to judge the quick and the dead. I believe in the Holy Spirit, the Holy Catholic Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and the life everlasting. Amen. Now we'll take a few minutes to greet our friends and neighbors, especially Amy, because this is early. <laughs> I don't know if we're ever going to try to get this service going again. I, uh, <laughs> Pastor Johnson, you never had that problem, did you? Uh, never, never.
It is a good thing to be together. Uh, at one church I was at, um, not this one, they, uh, this was back before we did all this streaming stuff and everything, but uh, they recorded their services, and so I asked Pastor to send me tapes so I could hear how they did things, and um, he sent me several. Most of them were corrupted, and I couldn't hear much, but on the one that I did hear, as they did this greeting time together, the pastor left his microphone on as he talked with people, and I heard somebody say to him, I'm not sure I heard the question, I heard his response. He said, yeah, I know him. He's a pretty good guy. I, I think he'll be all right here. And I thought to myself, oh, I'm glad that's what he said about me. Uh, you, know, uh, uh, you know, it's good. Uh, anybody got birthdays and anniversaries in the month of March? It is the time to celebrate that. So, Amy, come on up here. Uh, who else? Uh, anybody going to come up front? Okay, uh, Angie and uh, Carson, I see Harry's coming up here, so uh, uh, this is good. Well, all right. <laughs> all right, well, uh, Harry, you're up here by yourself, so it's a birthday, right? All right, well, uh, all right. Uh, anything you want to tell us about this birthday? Um, <laughs> all right, Amy, uh, birthday, right? Today's Wednesday because I had to march because you must be aware of me. And I am going to be able to draw my first Social Security check on May. Isn't that good? <laughs> <laughs> it's coming. It's coming. All right, Carson, you got a birthday. Uh, it's on the 20th, and I'll be 20. 24 years old, okay, well, that's a celebration. And Angie, you said you got an anniversary? Uh, 26 years on March the 4th. Okay. Which was Elena and uh, Chris's anniversary also. Oh, well, okay, they're, they're not here, so we'll uh, sing to them in absentia. Maybe they're watching us somewhere out there in the uh, internet world, but let's sing happy birthday. Happy birthday to you, happy birthday to you, happy birthday, God bless you, happy birthday to you, happy anniversary to you, happy anniversary to you, happy anniversary, God bless you, happy anniversary to you. Let's get our handles and sing. Our next hymn this morning is Grace Greater Than Our Sin, which is number 365. And I don't know this song that well, so you all are going to lead it. Marvelous grace of our loving
our screen and on the back of your bulletin we do have a list of prayer requests uh, I have additional needs but uh, Pastor Johnson called me this week and said we'd like to have Melanie O'Rear uh, added to the list she's just been discovered to have a brain tumor lives down in Alabama so having surgery tomorrow morning uh, we talked last night and they believe that they're going to be able to get that and uh, so we'll pray for her. Is she cousin? Uh, uh, niece. Niece. Yeah. Okay. In Alabama. Right. And uh, so we'll pray for her. And uh, then I have a text from Holly this morning. It says, uh, I am at MTSU watching Amelia play volleyball <laughs> today. But she said, I do have prayer requests. Uh, some of my, several of my patients and friends are going through some really difficult seasons, and the family of Edna Ruth Lewis and Jody McGriff. So we want to lift them up in prayer today as well. Do y'all have other updates or requests that you uh, want to? I'd like to put my brother on the prayer list, L.A. Johnson. He's been here several times, but for a long time he thought he never would have to go to a doctor, so he didn't really take. several things wrong and he's very upset about it. Uh, diabetes, uh, breathing problems, a uh, couple other things and so just remember him in your prayers because he's 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 not a good patient. So, <laughs> so I, I kind of identify with that whole yeah. situation except yeah. I've always gone to the doctor. I tell the doctor whenever yeah. I go to him that I'd be healthy if I didn't come to him. Yeah, um, that's what he said. <laughs> uh, so uh, they can help us. Yes, so Susan. Uh, Wendy Smith, uh, she said, follow up this line. They have found a uh, brain tumor. Um, they are they were supposed to go Friday, and I haven't heard uh, the result of the, the treatments for them. So just keep her in her family and prayers as well. Let's do. I know Mandy well. And, uh, you know, bless them. Yeah. Y'all didn't hear that. That's Iris uh, uh, going to the doctor right now because of a scratched eye and infection. So uh, we want to pray for her and their family as they deal with that. Jean? others let's pray oh lord we have so many things that we're concerned about today and these that have been brought up here today and we pray lord for each one we recognize that you can do what we can't even understand and so lord i just ask that you would come and touch people's bodies uh we particularly think of uh, those who are uh so close to us here and I think of Iris and of course these that are over here that uh, live all around Miss Jean and uh, we think of LA today Lord I just pray that you'd help him uh, we thank you for the fact that the doctors have identified what he needs and we just ask Lord that you just uh, give him the ability to do what needs to be done for him uh, and for others of us that have dealt with other kinds of uh, health concerns like this uh, Lord, help us raise up a spirit of health and strength and vitality amongst us uh, as we have been through a season of disease and illness. And Lord, we just ask that you'd help us to recognize that you are in charge of what goes on in our bodies and you are able to do what needs to be done for us. Now, Lord, we do have uh, many needs uh, here uh, in this place today. We ask that you'd uh, touch each one of these that uh, uh, are amongst us. We know that not every need's been mentioned out loud, but we believe you can take care of it. And in the midst of everything, Lord, we believe that 
Uh, you're at work in places beyond here. We don't want to just pray for our own needs or just for our physical uh, needs of those that we love. Uh, we pray that you would be involved in the affairs of the world, uh, that you would guide the hearts of leaders of nations, and that even as now we see that there is violence and suffering and war going on in places around the world, we ask, Lord, that you would touch and help and do what needs to be done uh, amongst uh, every place. And we pray for our own nation as well, Lord. Uh, we pray that uh, our leaders would act in accordance with your will and that we would recognize that you are at work. We pray for all those who serve our nation in whatever position today, whether they be in political office of whatever party or position, uh, we ask that you'd guide and direct. We also pray for those who serve our country's military, Lord, that you'd keep them safe and that all of us would know that you are working to bring about your will in the world. So, Lord, just now we come to you in a moment of silence because we know that your word tells us that at those times when we don't even know how to pray, that your spirit helps us. And so do that for us just now. Could we pray together the prayer that our Lord taught us to pray, the Lord's Prayer? Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. Lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power, and the glory forever. Amen. Amen. Ushers, will you come and help us with this morning's tithes and offerings? Let's praise the Lord with the doxology. Praise God from whom all blessings fall. Praise Him, all creatures here below. Praise Him above ye heavenly hosts. Praise Father, Son, and Holy Ghost.
thank you, Lord, for the way you've supplied all our needs. Help us as we give to the church to be obedient to you and that we might be the church you've called us to be. Help us to search your word and your way and live according to your uh, precepts and the way you've called us to live. Amen. It just takes longer when you just got one, uh, you know, so, uh, you know, bless him. <laughs> Thank you, Aaron, for your help today. <laughs> uh, indeed. Uh, <laughs> uh, he's, he's going back and forth here. I understand that. Uh, no, uh, it's all right. I'm looking this morning at John chapter 3. I hope you all get a Bible and follow along with me. I uh, have had a couple of you say to me from time to time, Preacher, you have really pestered us about you know, bringing our Bibles to church, and so we're having to start doing that. And I was like, I thought everybody brought their Bibles to church. Uh, now, one of the things that I have come to more and more realize is that an awful lot of people have their Bibles right here, and, uh, and I kind of do too for most of what I do through the week, but uh, I just think there's something about printed out Word of God, although that may just be because I'm of a, I'm of a certain age. Uh, you know, I told my son one time, who, you know, knows more Bible than I do. Uh, 
that I thought the King James Version was just the way the Bible's supposed to sound. And he said to me, not to me, Dad, I think it sounds like the New International Version. And uh, so I had to smile and say, uh, different experiences in life raise up different ways of being. So, you know, when I was growing up, we didn't have anything else but the uh, uh, King James Version. So uh, I think when I was 12, I asked my parents for Christmas uh, for a modern language Bible. Uh, and I think that I was asking for the Revised Standard Version, which basically just went through and took the these and vows out and was pretty much the same. Uh, but that was about the only modern language version that I knew there was in the Bible. And lo and behold, they gave me a living New Testament. I, I was somewhat surprised a few years later after the whole living Bible had come out that uh, there were people protesting that it was, you know, inspired by the devil or something uh, because I opened that up on Christmas morning and I just couldn't get enough of it. I read it all day. I, you know, it was easy to read. And, and so y'all know what my attitude is about what the best version of the Bible is the one you'll read. Uh, always going to be true because uh, in every version of the Bible uh, there is the truth of God. And of course, you know, I've been interested from time to time to run into people who want to say this version is the only one or something like that. And the truth of the matter is uh, the Bible was not originally written in English, Daryl, uh, it has to be translated. And so the King James Version was translated back uh, a long time ago now, even before Pastor Johnson was born. Uh, and they, you know, the English language uh, has changed. Now, some of the changes I don't like. <laughs> some of them I do. But I say read the Bible. Now, for those of you who were here last week, I just want you to be aware that I am aware that I am reading exactly the same passage of Scripture this week as I read last week. Uh, but, you know, more and more I understand that there's more here uh, than we can deal with, and it tells us the message of Jesus. So uh, I hope you'll follow along with me again today as I read John chapter 3, beginning at verse 1, and I'm going to read down through verse uh, 17, although that's a pretty arbitrary place to stop. Uh, I, I just keep going, but uh, let me talk about it a little bit uh, to expand upon what I talked about last week. And here's the story. There was a man of the Pharisees named Nicodemus, a ruler of the Jews. This man came to Jesus by night, and said to him, Rabbi, we know that you are a teacher come from God, for no one can do these signs that you do unless God is with him. Jesus answered and said to him, Most assuredly, I say to you, unless one is born again, he cannot see the kingdom of God. Nicodemus said to him, How can a man be born when he is old? Can he enter a second time into his mother's womb and be born? Most assuredly, I say to you, unless one is born of water and the Spirit, he cannot enter the kingdom of God. That which is born of the flesh is flesh, and that which is born of the Spirit is spirit. Do not marvel that I said to you, you must be born again. The wind blows where it wishes, and you cannot hear the sound of it, but uh, you can hear the sound of it, but you cannot tell where it comes from and where it goes. So is everyone who is born of the Spirit. Nicodemus answered and said to him, How can these things be? And Jesus answered and said to him, Are you the teacher of Israel and do not know these things? Most assuredly I say to you, we speak what we know and testify what we have seen, and you do not receive our witness. If I have told you earthly things and you do not believe, how will you believe if I tell you heavenly things? No one has ascended to heaven, but he who came down from heaven, that is the Son of Man, who is in heaven. 
And as Moses lifted up the serpent in the wilderness, even so must the Son of Man be lifted up, that whoever believes in him should not perish but have eternal life. For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten Son, that whoever believes in him should not perish but have everlasting life. For God did not send his Son into the world to condemn the world, but that the world through him might be saved. Now, interesting here, uh, one of the things that you see in various versions of the Bible is, and this kind of helps you find things, but it's not part of the Bible, is that there are headings for certain sections. And the heading here in the version of the Bible that I'm looking at, which doesn't match up with what's few Bibles or what you may have, unless you're looking at the same version I am, that heads this up as the new birth. Now, I talked briefly about the new birth last week, but I was kind of referencing uh, this uh, new movie that came out, The Jesus Revolution, and we talked about the fact that, you know, I went to that movie and uh, it helped me remember some things from my youth. Uh, for some of y'all, that was a long time ago, but it just seems like yesterday, uh, Pastor Johnson. Uh, but, you know, there was this tremendous revival that swept the country. Uh, some people call it the Jesus Movement deal, but one of the things, and I remember this so well all, all around where I was back in those days, even though I didn't really know the people that, this movie was talking about because it was talking about the hippies out in California and I told you last week that I was grown before I ever knew a hippie. We didn't have them around where I came from out in the country in northern middle Tennessee. Did y'all know them? I found some in Nashville once I moved to Nashville. Uh, but the thing that the movie brought out that I remember so strongly is that people were asking each other, what if this is real? Well, what I didn't expand on that I want to talk about a little bit is because I want to say to you that it's real. What we're talking about here is real. Now, the new birth, and I tried to figure out what's the best way to talk about this. I finally put up on screen in the bulletin, spiritual birth, but primarily what that's talking about is the fact that each one of us has got to be initiated. Jesus called it being born into the kingdom of God. That is not something that happens naturally. We don't grow into it because it's a different kind of reality than we see. And so immediately after Nicodemus begins to say, born again? How can that happen? I mean, you're born once and then you start growing up and you can't go back into your mother's womb. That's pretty weird when you start trying to visualize that, right? But what Jesus is saying is that spiritual birth is birth into a new kind of reality that does exist, but we're largely unaware of it. Now, this is not the only place this talks about this kind of difference between this world and the spiritual world. They coexist together. They work together in many ways. I mean, what you do in the physical world affects what is going on in the spiritual world. Uh, you know, one of the things that I think about uh, in the ways that public discourse has been going on, at least in our country, I think it's all around the world at this point, is that we've been told over and over again, follow the science. Well, you know, I, y'all, I went to graduate school. I took courses in the research methodology. I think I know how to read scientific literature, but you've got to begin to ask the question, what do they mean? Because everybody that uses the term science seems to mean something different by that. Uh, 
Now, I just recently read a book uh, talking about philosophical history, and about 200 years ago in Europe, there was this philosophical movement. It affected a whole lot of people in the way we think. Uh, it was philosophy, and it was psychology, and it was natural sciences, and it changed the way people look at it. And some of the big names in that were Nietzsche and Darwin and Freud. And one of the things that they really tried to teach people to do is to say there is no reality except what we can see. Y'all know that's just a silly idea. Now, I could go into that for longer than I've got in the next month. But it's just a silly idea. Because we live and work with realities constantly that we can't see. Uh, I took my, my grandchildren had a day off from school for teacher conferences on Friday. And I took them up to our place up north of Nashville. Uh, and we spent several hours out in the woods pretending like we were cutting trees. Uh, my five-year-old grandson, as we drove into the road, he looked over at a fence alongside the road, and yes, there are cattle in that fence, sometimes at least. And he said, Grandpa, that's an electric fence. Now, I do not know where James became aware that there was such a thing as an electric fence. I don't think there's an electric fence up there anymore, but I can tell you there used to be when I was five years old. And I well remember my older brother uh, encouraging me to touch that fence. Um, And then I did it again. I, you know, I'm just weird enough that I kind of like that feel of shock, you know. Uh, what I learned was, it took me a while, is that every time you touch it, it gets stronger, right? Uh, you know, because you want to warn the cattle that are in there not to come against it. But you know what? I couldn't, I couldn't see it. I couldn't see it. I think I got out there and touched it in the dark one time and I saw something. But that was an effect of it. It wasn't the electricity. But oh my, wouldn't it be a strange world if suddenly we decided that there's no such thing as electricity because we can't see it. You know, one of the things I'm still trying to figure out is that, and you know, we particularly struggle with this a couple of weeks ago here is that we've got what they call Wi-Fi internet all through the air right here in this building. Except when the equipment broke down a couple of weeks ago and then it wasn't working anymore and suddenly we didn't have access to our instant knowledge. But I can't see it. It's back working just like it's supposed to. I don't know what happened. But you can't see it. Is it real? Well, you know, of course, some of us depend on phone signals, which we don't get much right here in this location, so you have to have that Wi-Fi signal to make it work. But I can tell you that as recently as six, seven years ago, when I read things about people saying, we're going to have devices that are always connected to the internet, I said, uh, not me. I'm not paying for that. Y'all ever said that? <laughs> There's realities that we can't see that we know are real. Now, probably more real than some of the other things that we think of as scientific are the realities that really do control our lives, like love,
and caring. But I can tell you that Sigmund Freud taught us that that was just kind of an outgrowth of some physical structure in our brain. And it's really, if we analyze that, an offshoot of some physical process. Do you believe that? I don't. You know why I don't believe that? Because that's not what God's Word tells us. And this works better. That's not the reason I believe it. But it works better because it's real than any of the realities that Sigmund Freud, which incredibly creative thinker, but when he tried to convince us that the only realities were things that we can see and touch and feel, he's just wrong. And there's been some others since then who've tried to find ways to create that. But if somebody, by saying we ought to pay attention to the science, is saying to us the only thing that's real are those things that we can touch, and that we can see and we can somehow or another physically quantify, we can discount that. Now, true science is built on the idea that we can replicate the situation and the results will be repeatable. I really thought maybe, and I remember in my youth at least, I studied in school people who said that's the way the spiritual work, world works too. So all we have to do is find out what those spiritual laws are. You know, back when I was high school, and this influenced me greatly, there was an organization, uh, it's still around, called Campus Crusade for Christ. Bill Bright organized that organization, and uh, I remember very strongly and I've sometimes talked about it that my youth minister at my church took me to a meeting at some little house over in East Nashville when I was a senior in high school and we sat around uh, on the floor and on old couches and played guitars and sang and then somebody taught. It was a neat kind of gathering. Uh, we got out a little booklet and went through the steps to spiritual reality. Any of y'all ever experienced somebody sharing the four spiritual laws with you? That was what we were going to do. I mean, and we had a plan. We were going to share the gospel with everybody by saying, here's the four spiritual laws that will lead you to knowing God. If you'll do one, two, three, four. I could quote them for you today. I mean, it's not a problem. That's not what the Bible tells us. It's the way the spiritual world works. Did y'all read this? Now, one of the things that I think is interesting about this passage that I just read, Jesus said, and this is verse uh, 8 here, and we ought to pay attention to this because that's part of what I'm trying to do is to stay with this. By the way, next week I'm planning to put up here spiritual birth, scripture, John 3.17, part 3. But here's what the nature of the spiritual world is that sometimes people ignore. Uh, and that is, Jesus said, the wind blows where it wishes and you cannot hear the sound of it. But, I'm, I keep saying not in there and it's not there. The wind blows where it wishes and you hear the sound of it but cannot tell where it comes from and where it goes so is everyone who is born of the Spirit. Now, uh, there's a problem in translating this verse. I was talking about different translations. The original language that Jesus, uh, that these were written down in was the Greek language. Uh, I've studied the Greek language some, but don't think in any way that I know everything about it. Uh, I certainly can't just pick up a Greek version without some helps and follow it, but one of the, th the realities is, th uh, in this verse, is that the Greeks, they kind of had this problem that they didn't understand spiritual reality very much. As a matter of fact, Greek religion was weird 
by our thinking, they had lots and lots of different gods who acted just like we do, except they had more power. <laughs> uh, but in their language, the word that we translate spirit here is the same word that we translate wind from here in this verse. It is also the same word that would be if you were going to say breath. Wind, breath, spirit. That's all these Greeks understood about the nature of spiritual reality. And so I've sometimes said that if you take the same word and translate it two different ways in the same verse, you're kind of being dishonest, except that I don't see any alternative to this in this verse. He says, the wind, you don't know what it's going to do. Isn't that the truth? You know, in my property up there in Robertson County uh, that I kind of inherited, except I had to buy it from my brother and sisters, uh, some wind came through down the, up there and blew over a bunch of trees. And I can't get back down the trail to my campsite now until I find a way to get those trees out of the way. Uh, and I don't really have the equipment to do that. So. Uh, Yesterday afternoon, I went up there and met with the real estate uh, agent who manages my property, and he brought somebody up there who had the equipment and is going to clear out a bunch of that stuff for me. One of the problems I've got, might be the biggest, is that our house that we've got rented out had a tree fall toward the house, uh, but it got caught in another tree. Y'all seen that happen? So it's just hanging up there in that other tree. Uh, we got to get somebody to get that out without knocking it against the house. I thought I might do it, but I can tell you that I have tried to cut trees like that before and knocked them into the house. How did that happen? Well, the wind came. I didn't know that was going to happen. The weather people didn't predict it. It did things that I can't even imagine. Because wind will do that. Now, one of the things that just shocks me when I read spiritual literature is how often people who write books, they're well respected, they say, let's find the scriptural pattern for this or that. And so they say, well, God did this here in this situation in the Bible, so that's the way we ought to expect God to work in our lives. It's the way a lot of preaching happens. What did God say? The Spirit blows wherever it will. And you can't tell where it's going to go. So one of the problems that I have with listening to these people say, if we'll just follow the scriptural pattern, God will come and do these things in our lives, is that I can't find any place in the Bible where God repeated the way he did things. He was constantly working in people's lives, but every time it was something new. And... Me and my, I want things to be predictable. I want them to be repeatable. I want there to be the four spiritual laws. You know, one of the stories that's really affected me in my life was uh, one of my seminary professors, who's one of the great missionaries of the 20th century. Uh, he told a story, and back in these days, it seems like everybody that told a story about witnessing was talking about sitting next to somebody on the airplane that they started a conversation with. Those stories never help me much because I don't fly on airplanes very much. Um, but he told the story. He said he sat down and opened up his Bible, and uh, the guy sitting next to him was college age, and he looked over at him and 
start up conversation and said, you're reading the Bible? And he said, well, yes, I am. And, and uh, he said, well, you know, what do I need to do to know God? And wow, big opening. And he said, you know, I had to decide how am I going to share the gospel with him. So he said, I just, without the little booklet, I shared the four spiritual laws with him. And this fellow looked at me and he said, I've heard this before. He said, there's these people on my college campus. They run around with these little booklets and, and they read it to me. And I prayed that prayer in it, but nothing happened. How come? And my professor said, I just looked at him and said, well, what do you think? Good response, by the way, when you don't know what is going on. He said, he said to him, maybe it's because I'm not willing to give up living with my girlfriend. And he said, I just looked at him and said, maybe. So there's more than saying words to the work of the Holy Spirit. There's a willingness to let God take over your life and change it and make it whatever God wants it to be. And how many times over the years as a pastor have I had somebody say to me when we were talking about what God had done in somebody's life that they would say to me, oh, I could never do that. I think I used to say that too. And I want to say to you that if you let the Spirit of God work in your life, it's anything God wants. Anything. Now, why would that be? Because He's changed me. His Spirit is now part of me. I don't just operate by some simple whatever works best for me anymore or whatever I can see or whatever else because when the Spirit of God gets a hold of you, nothing else matters. I was in an evangelism class years ago where the professor said, well, we don't tell people what it costs to be spiritual when we evangelize them. We first got to get them to pray. That's not what Jesus said. He said, before you start down this road, you ought to count the cost. How much is it worth? Jesus said, it's worth everything to become part of the kingdom. Everything. It's worth everything. Now, I suspect that that's what you've got to do to have a spiritual birth, is be ready to give up everything. But I think I've known people who had that spiritual birth before they gave up everything. But once the spiritual birth came, then they were ready to give up everything. But what they get back in return is so much more. But, preacher, I didn't like it. When God told me to do something, I know. There's some things I didn't like giving up too. You know what the Apostle Paul said about that? He said, I count it as, I started to say the word that the Bible actually means, but I'll do it the way most translations do. Uh, I count it as nothing now. Those things didn't matter because of the exceeding greatness of the power of God. Would you bow with me and pray? Oh Lord, help us to know a spiritual reality that puts us in touch with you and changes us 
and makes us part of a new world and a new kingdom and a new reality. Help us, Lord, to respond to whatever you've called us to do so that we might know the reality of the Spirit in our lives. Amen. Amen. Daryl, come lead us in song. Final song, a hymn is number 382, Have Thine Own Way, Lord. Please stand. As we go today, let's go in the power of the Spirit, knowing that God will be with us. Amen.